thank you very much, Brother Al, for your very kind introduction. Um, it's amazing how much Brother Al knows me. <laughs> I tried to keep my bio data short, but Brother Al insisted on telling everyone a bit more about me, which I suppose is okay. <laughs> so it saves me the my own introduction. So how's everyone this morning? Good, yeah, okay. Do you like the, uh, there was Ajahn Brahma in it, yeah? Uh, leading through the meditation and in a way radiating metta to your entire body, yeah? All your different body parts. I thought that was quite nice. And, uh, you know, I'm not very good with sitting cross-legged and often I, you know, I get sort of funny sensation, but it does work when you radiate loving kindness and the sensation does go away. So I think following on from the radiation of loving kindness to our body parts, I think a lot of us as Buddhists, we, we do try to have some metta meditation uh, at least once a week here. We try to radiate loving kindness to ourselves and to people around us, people that we know and people that we don't know. But I suppose today what I want to talk about is to bring it another step further that uh, beyond radiating loving kindness to yourself, to people that you know, but actually, actually carrying out deeds of loving kindness, deeds of compassion to people that you know, and more often than not, people that you don't know, strangers. Yeah? Because I think that's another step forward in the, the Buddhist practice that perhaps uh, some of us may be familiar with, uh, some of us less so. But hopefully by the end of this talk, I will have inspired everyone to have a think about how we can actually practice the, the Dharma through carrying out humanitarian work. Um, that has anyone involved in any sort of like voluntary work, humanitarian work, either in Singapore or overseas? I know Sister Bita is involved in the, the Firefly mission. Anyone else involved in any organization? Yeah, let me just raise your hand. Just yeah. Everyone's a bit shy. To <laughs> I'm sure there are many more who may be involved in some ways, maybe if not currently in the past, but hopefully many more in the future. Um, so, yeah, does this work? Okay, so bit, it's a bit of a time delay, so time to practice uh, patience. <laughs> so a bit of background about myself. A lot of delay, actually. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, I was born and I grew up in Malaysia. And subsequently, I spent quite a bit of time overseas uh, studying and working. And as uh, Brother Al mentioned, I first encountered the Dharma as a teenager. So largely self-taught initially. Uh, largely the theoretical to begin with. It was <laughs> Buddhism was a theoretical pursuit. You know, it made a lot of sense, answered a lot of my questions. But I have, I'll be the first to confess that it's only later on in life when I put the Dharma in practice, when I experience the Dharma, and then the true beauty of Buddhism, the Dharma, becomes true. And uh, I hope it's something that you're all experiencing, that when you practice the Dharma, the, the true beauty, beauty shines through. So I'm still a student, I'm still learning. I wouldn't have to consider myself an expert. And in fact, uh, I would say that I'm quite, I was quite nervous initially. Uh, when Sister, Sister Vita asked me, I was trying to come up with all sorts of excuses not to give a talk, but I suppose uh, as a Buddhist, um, it's give and take. Of course, I've taken a lot. Yeah? I mean, the, over the years, the number of Dharma talks I've attended, the number of Dharma books I've read. So someone has written the books, someone has given the talks, so I have received a lot. So I think it's time I give back as well to share what the little bit that I know and hopefully inspire everyone else to share as well. So I'm quite new to Singapore. I only moved here three years ago, and I like it a lot. It's been a very positive move for myself, uh, my family, my wife, and my two young children, uh, and also for my career. But the other thing is uh, moving to Singapore has opened up many doors for me to carry out our voluntary and humanitarian work. And I'd like to just share a bit about uh, some of my experiences with this. So humanitarian work or aid, I think if you look at the definition, it's defined as the effort to provide material assistance, uh, example, money, food, water, medicine, toiletries, clothing, blankets, all sorts of things. 
Because if you think about it, it's often to people who have lost everything due to something happening, usually a natural disaster or sometimes man-made disaster, losing your home, losing all your belongings suddenly. Yeah? So when you think about humanitarian aid, it's all the things that we take for granted, things that we use every day. Yeah, we have access to food, clean water, medicine, toiletries for the ladies, sanitary pad for the men, razor blades. Imagine if you lose everything and you don't have access to what you, ha what you, what you use day to day. So you know, in terms of humanitarian aid, these are things that essential things that people need. So it's material things and also logistical assistance, for example, medical care, safe shelter. When you don't have a roof over your head and you're at the mercy of, the, of nature, when there's heavy rain, when there's been a typhoon, yeah? Uh, power supply. I mean, imagine if there's no power supply. How, how well do we function? Yeah, I mean, how dependent. Even this Dharma talk, we need a projector, we need the lights, the aircon. Imagine if there's a total power cut now. That's the end of the talk because without the aircon, you know, the condition in here will become unbearable. So humanitarian aid is about providing the basics in life when people lose it all. Yeah, things that we take for granted. Transportation, how do you get from one place to another? Communication, yeah? Uh, something happened to you. How do you tell the rest of your family and friends that you are safe if you don't have your mobile phone with you? Yeah, and if you don't have your mobile phone, do you remember all the numbers, people you're supposed to call? You know, so when things happen, these are often things that we take for granted. When other people are suffering, sometimes it's hard to empathize. Oh, what are they missing? You know, they lost everything, but what does it mean to the people? So hopefully this gives you an idea about the impact the, the, you know, that the people face when there's a natural disaster. It's just losing the basic things in life, significant impact. And it's for humanitarian purposes. And typically in response to humanitarian crises, including natural and man-made disasters, nowadays the line between natural and man-made is a bit blurred now. Isn't it? I mean, the changes in the weather, how much of that is man-made, how much of that is a natural nature cycle. It's all a grey area nowadays. And of course, the primary objective of humanitarian aid is to save lives where possible in the early stages, uh, when there's a lot of water, people are drowning. But even later on, when you have diseases, when you don't have access to sanitation, clean water, things like cholera, you know, that often kills a lot more people after the, in in the initial disaster. And of course, uh, where you can save lives, you save. For those who are still alive, try to alleviate their suffering. Okay? And of course, to, let, to allow them to maintain the human dignity. When you've lost everything, really, how do you maintain your dignity when you only got the clothes on your back and those clothes are wet as well? Yeah? And if you look at uh, some, like uh, Wikipedia, you know, they try to differentiate develop humanitarian aid from development aid, which seeks to address the underlying social economic factors which may have led to the crisis or emergency. But again, there's a lot of grey area in many parts of the world that is hit repeatedly by natural disaster. Is there a clear line between what's humanitarian and what's development? In areas where there's chronic poverty, chronic lack of leadership in a country, chronic uh, corruption, where development just cannot take place. You know, so uh, for example, if you think about the Philippines, um, this year, you know, the, the place that was hit by Haiyan, 2013, this uh, end of last year, again, they had quite a big typhoon, not as bad as before, but before people even have time to rebuild their lives, another round comes in, right? So often it's an ongoing cycle. I mean, we don't have to go too far. I mean, from Singapore, okay, I've not been in Singapore very long, but when was the last time Singapore was hit by any natural disaster? I've heard about flooding in Orchard Road uh, several <laughs> years ago. <laughs> but that's not happened since, right? Yeah. And I assume somewhere like Singapore, there'll be no loss of lives, just loss of properties, right? Cars and... So generally, Singapore is quite safe and uh, I think we are quite fortunate. But we don't have to go too far. Like I've said I'm from Malaysia, so just recently, I'm sure all of you have heard the news about the very severe flooding in many parts of Malaysia, the east, eastern part, the southern part. And these are, unfortunately, the poor, poor, poorest states in, in Malaysia, the least developed states as well. So places like Kelantan, 
Tengganu. I don't know if anyone has ever been to this place. Yeah. I mean, typically when Singaporeans travel, they prefer to go to like KL, JB, Penang, usually on the west, west coast. Yeah, so I think apparently this was like the worst flood in 30 to 40 years and causing unprecedented level of uh, destruction, property to damage, loss of lives. And I think more than 200,000 people were displaced. And the water levels was very high. And I mean, over here you can see it's uh, at least a meter. But I managed to get this picture from the internet just to remind how high the water level was this time. I mean, the sort of like photograph at the top showing the same place, the petrol station. And then during the flooding, you can see the water level was at the level of the top of the petrol station. So that's at least, what, 20 feet of water? So it's, uh, yeah, certainly for many people, not in living memories, the, the level of water. And I mean, like the entire of Kotabaru, which is the capital of Kelantan, was uh, which, uh, completely flooded. Oh dear. I was actually back in Malaysia during the floods, but uh, fortunately my mom and dad, they live in Kuala Lumpur, and to a large extent Kuala Lumpur was spared from the flooding, so uh, I, was con I considered myself lucky. I was able to, able to make my way back to Singapore, and uh, the highway w highways were still open, even though many parts of Johor were actually flooded. Anyway, the next page just shows slides of what happened after the flood. Usually it looks bad during the flood, but actually afterwards, when the water has gone down, it looks even worse because the amount of mud, rubbish, debris. Because the sort of things that people lose, you know, when water enters your house, everything is washed away, everything that you own. Yeah, it just gets mixed around and it becomes part of the debris that is found in your house and outside the house. So the amount of debris can often be, uh, you know, un understated unless you're actually there. You can be shocked at the amount of uh, rubbish that flooding creates. I mean, if, if you're able to think of how much stuff we all have in our house, right? And if all these things are out in the streets from every single home, can you get the amount of debris? Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah. So again, uh, some photographs showing the aftermath how messy everything looks, you know, like a photograph taken from a school and how wet and damaged the furnitures were. A lot of the houses in that part of Malaysia are made from wood, zinc roof, you know, so they don't, they don't stand up to the flooding. And often the only structure left will be the steps that's made from concrete and bricks. And the cleanup process, yeah. Often, literally, these people would have lost everything, their house and all their belongings. The worst thing is often important documents, you know, your birth certificates, your passport, your ICs, uh, you know, all your bank statements, you know, tremendous amount of inconvenience. Uh, but fortunately, the loss of lives was uh, uh, not that many, you know, fortunately in that sense. Um, yeah, and loss of uh, vehicles as well. Okay. And of course, the early humanitarian effort is largely large, uh, led by the government usually the armed forces because they had the infrastructure. You know, many parts of the flooded areas were just completely inaccessible. So you needed helicopters to fly in the relief goods, medical care, makeshift clinics. And initially, for most people, it's just, you know, um, camping out in schools and other government buildings on, on higher ground. And for these people, you know, it's just everyone gets together. There's no privacy. You know, there's actually no privacy. There's very little space and, I mean, imagine this is for a few hours, even one or two days, but for some of these people, they would have been there for like weeks, yeah? Later on, you know, when things were more organized, you get this little cubicle, where at least you get some, a bit of privacy, a, a little bit of dignity back. But still, you can see the amount of space that you need to put up these little tents. So certainly relief efforts are in place. And generally for any 
natural disaster, there are different phases to the humanitarian work. The immediate rescue, saving lives. Then later on, when people need to rebuild their life, the cleaning up process, that can take months, that can take years. I mean, how long does it go on for? And how long do people support? I mean, generally, people support it until the next natural disaster, right? Somewhere else in the world. Then people forget about, oh, that. And then everyone's attention moves on to the next. You know, and unfortunately, we seem to be seeing a lot of a lot more natural disaster nowadays. You know, many places in the world. You know, and uh, uh, in a way, sometimes there's a bit of fatigue as well, and it starts to bl blend into one. And um, but I think as Buddhists, it's something that we always need to bear in mind that there's a lot of suffering happening happening around us, some close to us and some not so close to us. I mean, and humanitarian aid. I mean, I'm speaking on the secular term now, before I go into the Dhamma of it. There's also a lot of controversies, yeah? I mean, there's always this argument, what's the role of the government? What's the role of the NGOs? Who should be doing what? Yeah, shouldn't it be the government's job to prevent the flood to begin with? You know, and if the flood happens, shouldn't it be the government to come up with the money? But then the money is taxpayers' money as well, so it's, it's money from the people. What's the role of the NGO? Who should come in at what point? Yeah, so a lot of uh, controversies, a lot of pitfalls in doing humanitarian work. And of course, the question is always, uh, is the right aid getting to the right people at the right place at the right time? Um, you know, recently there was an article in the Malaysian papers about how there was a lot of donation for electrical goods. And they were saying, well, people have lost their home. It will take them months. They are homeless now. The last thing they need is electrical goods because there's no power as to where to use it. So it's about... I mean, that may be useful months down the line. Once people have rebuilt their homes, they need new electrical goods. So it's about giving the right thing at the right time. What they need now is food, hot food, safe water. Yeah? Uh, because the drainage, the sewage is all affected. Even the pipe water is not clean now. So I think recently the Singapore Armed Forces, they were there to provide some water purification uh, treatment, um, I think portable units. And then to the right people, and often a lot of the aid seems to go to the people where it's most accessible because it's easier to deliver the aid there. So you may find that certain communities, they have more aid than they need. Then there are certain communities they are harder to get to, they don't receive any. Yeah? So there's all these things, who, who, whose role is it to coordinate? And how do we make sure that everyone gets their fair share? So there's all these questions in uh, humanitarian work and I, I don't think I have all the answers. And then there's also the, th the thing about hidden agendas. And by that I mean, if you look internationally, whenever there's any foreign assistance, there's all these political issues as well. You know, certain countries will accept aid from certain countries, but certain countries, because it's a political thing, they'll say, no, we won't accept it, even if the gesture is genuine. So there's all these uh, bigger issues as well, often beyond our control. But even locally, like even in Malaysia, when the aid is offered by certain opposition parties, people may choose to reject it, and also there's a lot of the local political uh, agenda at work. And then there's also the hidden religious agenda sometimes. You know, people take this opportunity as a chance to uh, carry out evangelical activities. And then I think there's a lot of um, ethical questions here, whether you should be using the time when people are most in need, most vulnerable to be trying to convert others. So these are some of the isu real issues uh, that, that are often discussed. And then the question about whether sometimes it can cause more harm than good. There's this thing about the uh, uh, touristic uh, voluntary m uh, people who are supposedly trying to do good but end up causing more, more trouble because they become victims themselves. If you're not prepared, you don't have the right infrastructure to provide humanitarian aid. If you go out there, you contribute to the traffic, you contribute to the limited resources. And if you yourself, your car breaks down, you become stranded, and then you become a victim yourself. So I think even with good intentions, it's important that um, when humanitarian work is done, it's done properly. And uh, not, to, not for the people or organization who's trying to help others to need help themselves. And there's this thing about the cycle of dependency. Again, back to what I said earlier about in some parts of the world where there's chronic poverty and deprivation. It's just humanitarian work after humanitarian work because it's one cycle of disaster to the next cycle without any attempt or ability to carry out any developmental work in between. And then there's this 
worry that some countries may just be chronically dependent on NGOs to keep the people going. And the government take a step back and say, right, we let the foreign NGOs take over and run the country. So that I think it's important to be aware of all these discussions in the background, all this controversy about humanitarian work. So while it's good that we should be encouraged to do it, to be aware of all the pitfalls. So the question is, as Buddhists, what should we do? You know, as Buddhists, we are often known as a peaceful community. We try not to antagonize anyone. If there's anything controversial, we, we try to shine away. Is that true for the Buddhist community, generally? We try not to be confrontational. So if there's an area that has uh, controversies, we, try to, we tend to shine away. That, that's my own perception for the Buddhist community. Not all of you may agree, but I think but by and large, Buddhist tends to be more peaceful. There's good and there's bad to it. But as Buddhists, you know, uh, since there's all these controversies about humanitarian effort, should we then just stay away and say, oh, it's uh, too, many, uh, too many pitfalls? My answer is no, we should. We should be, as Buddhists, it should be part of our practice that we should be involved in humanitarian effort. We should persevere, but we should apply the principle to the Dharma. We should be mindful of any pitfalls and negative consequences, intended or otherwise. And we always seek to strive to overcome any shortcomings. Okay. So I just want to share with you um, my, some of my own experiences. I've been involved in with humanitarian work in the Philippines and also uh, the Cambodia. Uh, Cambodia is through another organization, but in the Philippines is through this uh, organization called Suji. I don't know if all of you have heard of it. It's uh, probably the largest uh, Chinese-based uh, NGOs in the world that uh, does humanitarian work. And it's actually got a uh, special consultative status with the United Nations as well. So I just want to share some of the experiences that I gained last year. Um, when I went with uh, about 50 other Suji members from Singapore, and we meet up with um, another 50 or so, in fact, more than 50. There were more than 100 Suji uh, volunteers from around the world, six countries, uh, going off to a part of the Philippines, Takuban and Omok, which was affected by the typhoon that happened in late 2013. And it was largely a medical humanitarian mission. And I want to share with you some of the reflections that I gained uh, during the trip. The part of Philippines that was hit the worst uh, is called the Leyte Islands. It's sort of like in the middle part of the Philippines. The Philippines has about 7,000 islands, and the Leyte Island is quite a large one, but uh, it's also in the pathway of the major typhoons. And I think Typhoon Haiyan, that happened at the end of 2013, that was a super typhoon. Something that happened not every year, thankfully, but maybe every few decades. So it's like a grade five, you know, it's the highest grade typhoon. And the level of destruction was, um, again, uh, not in recent memories. So any structure that's not made of concrete would be flattened. And even if the structure is made from concrete, they, they are not spared from the damage either because all the windows, all the doors would have been blown in. So the structure may be standing, but the inside of the buildings would have been completely destroyed. Yeah. And you know, even the ships and all that would have been blown onto, washed onto the uh, land. And then the last photo is just to show you, it's a satellite photo showing how uh, severe the destruction was. Because like in this place, uh, virtually the only structure le left sitting was that round structure, which is like the, I think probably the stadium or something. But you know, 90% of all the other buildings would have been destroyed. So it's complete devastation. You know, we a lot of loss of lives. I think six to 7,000 people lost their lives. Many more are missing. And millions of people were displaced, lost their homes. And as I mentioned earlier, this uh, late part of last year, again, the same area was hit by another big typhoon. And just when, you know, uh, people have yet to fully rebuild their lives. So quite sad, you know, I mean, um, looking at the photos, it's just trying to feel if you're there, you know, um, the amount of suffering that was going on. I just want to mention a bit about the Tima medical missions. Tima is the medical side of the Suchi. It stands for Tima, uh, Suchi International Medical Association. And it's through this organization that we carry out the medical humanitarian work. 
So we focus on providing humanistic medical care, meaning not just medical care, but medical care with loving kindness, with respect, with compassion. We are trying to treat patients holistically. And we always ensure that the medical care is delivered at no cost whatsoever to the recipients. So all medication, everything that the patient needs. And the way we do it is for everyone who volunteers to go along, we would have to agree to pay our own expenses all the way through. So your airfare, transportation, your lodging, your food, everything is covered by the members. And I think in Singapore, we are lucky, we are fortunate that most of us, we are financially, we are earning enough that we can pay our own ways. So this makes sure that if there's any public donations, yeah, the donation gets through to the recipient 100%. There's no haircut at all. Yeah, so I like that. And I think it's the same principle that Firefly Mission carries through. Yeah, you, you pay your own expenses. And the success of this uh, medical mission is dependent on the close collaboration between the different FEMA chapters in the different countries. Because you know from Singapore, you're trying to help out in the Philippines. There's no way we can do it without the cooperation of the FEMA Philippines. Yeah, we need them to provide the local logistics, lo local knowledge, language difficulties, and then telling us wh what they need. It's not about us Singapore saying, oh, we want to do good, we just go in and do whatever we want. It's about the locals telling us, hey, this is what we need. Please come and help us. <coughs> and I just want to stress that through this particular organization, which I'm sure is true for many or other organizations, is that the safety and well-being of volunteers is paramount. And I think that's important because for those of us who have not been, often you'd be worried, oh, is my life going to be in danger? Am I going to be taken ill by illnesses? And what's going to happen if something happens to me? I think these are legitimate concerns. And as I said earlier, it's important that if you're going to help, that you do not become a victim yourself. You do not become someone who takes up the local resources. Yeah, so it's important that we look after ourselves if you're trying to help others. The other thing that I've not mentioned about the way Tima runs its activities is that you don't need to be a Suchi member. Yeah, so it's only recently that I became a member myself, but before that, I was just involved as a volunteer. And you do not need to be a Buddhist either. In fact, you know, Tima, they volunteer everyone who subscribe to this uh, philosophy of helping others, regardless of your own religious beliefs. And similarly, similarly, the people that we help, you help all, regardless of their nationality, skin color, religion, gender. Okay, you help all. Okay, and it's an amazing thing about it. And also, it's important that during these activities that you don't make any attempt to spread your religion and you're there purely to help others. So you'll be asking, is there any Dharma when you're there? There's actually plenty of Dharma. Because the Dharma is through your own conduct, through your own practice. What you do, that is the Dharma. You do not need to go and preach to others that Buddhism is good. It's just through your own conduct, what you do. That is the Dharma. You are practicing the Dharma when you carry out the work. In terms of mission preparation, quite a logistical nightmare. Imagine if there's 50 volunteers from Singapore and trying to meet up with all the other volunteers from the many different countries. Lots of time spent planning, planning, planning. Many dedicated individuals around doing far more work than me. Yeah? Doing all the planning, putting everything together to make this happen and lots of hours, many evenings. There's a lot of attention to details as well. You know, name tags so that we know who everyone is. Journey there, it's quite difficult to get to, you know. Uh, Manila itself is like three hours on the flight. And then from Manila to fly to Tacloban is another hour plus. And then from the Tacloban to get to Omok is another three hours by land. And then trying to get everyone to arrive on time at the airport so that we don't miss our flight. Trying to get everyone to keep to their weight limit. Flying Jetstar. 10 kilograms, so that was my own baggage. I was quite proud that I was <laughs> right on the top, <laughs> unintentionally. <laughs> okay, yeah, because the rest of the check-in luggage, we use it to bring along medical supplies and equipment. Yeah, so for the volunteers, we were there for five days. We have to limit uh, what, what we were bringing along. And that was the team from Singapore. And then arrival in Takloban Airport. And Taklobang Airport itself, even though it was four months after the disaster, the airport was barely functioning. The conveyor belt, you know, for the luggage, that wasn't working. So everything was done manually. And the last photo just shows you how flat the whole area was and very close to the sea, in fact, right next to the sea. So that's why when the typhoon hits, there was just no, no shelter. 
yeah? ground arrangements. Now, this is something that I felt that I had to discuss because I had to say that it was a very comfortable arrangement for us. And I need to bring this up because very often people ask me, you know, when you're overseas trying to help others, is it right that you are so comfortable? Uh? Should you not be suffering yourself? You know? <laughs> Have you ever had this sort of thought? That when you're doing humanitarian work, should you be suffering as well? Otherwise, it's, it doesn't count anymore, that the value is less. I think there are different ways to look at it. For us, it was a medical humanitarian mission. And wh when we touched down in, in Manila, we actually spent the night in a hotel. A very comfortable hotel. I mean, it wasn't like a five-star hotel, but I'll tell you in a short while why that was important for us. I mean, first of all, we were paying our own ways, so we are not using any funds. And so the question was too comfortable? I think not. Because for us, you know, when you're there, it's hard work. Yeah, literally 10 hours or more a day, you're there seeing patients nonstop. Whether you're a doctor, allied health or nurse, thousands of patients, and it's extremely tiring. And I think the worst thing you can do is that if you are tired, you're going to be doing all sorts of mistakes. You won't be functioning at your best, and you don't really want that. You want the patients to get the best of you, that you are there to give them the best medical care. And in order to give the best medical care, you need to be well rested, well fed. So this issue of being too comfortable, I don't think arises, because I think it's crucial that we look after ourselves before we can look after others. Yeah? We should expect the same standard in Singapore and in the Philippines. Just as you do not want your doctor to operate on you after he's been up all night, why should the patients out there be expected to be treated by doctors who traveled like for 10 hours and not slept through the night and then trying to treat you? That's not right. We should. So it's out of respect to the people we're trying to help that we look after ourselves. Okay? And the way I look at it as well, we put ourselves up in a reasonable hotel, is our way of helping to contribute to the local economy. You know, the local economy is completely devastated. The hotels, the tourist industry. So by booking rooms in the local hotels, we contribute. It's income that goes back to the community. Yeah? So I think this is something that hopefully you all won't feel like, oh, it's wrong. But to see the logic, why it's important for you to be comfortable, where possible. And of course, we were there four months after the disaster. There's still a lot of evidence of damage. This was like in the Superdome in Omok where we did one of the missions and the structure is intact, but the windows, everything is broken and still not changed. And the floor in the stadium has been damaged by water and it's still not replaced. So there's a lot of buckling in the floor. And also traveling there, you can see that still a lot of visible damage and there's not really been uh, a full success in rebuilding their lives yet. But of course, there's a lot of ongoing local effort to do that. So international collaboration and cooperation, there were volunteers from six different countries, led by the Philippines. There were volunteers from Malaysia, Singapore, Taiwan, United States, and uh, there was one from Sweden as well. So a lot of the doctors are their own local doctors. And on the ground, there was a lot of expertise. You know, there were more than 20 dentists, many doctors, many, many nurses at Allied Health. Uh, and there was a lot of energy as well because the number of patients were just staggering. You know, the long queues. And, and I think what I observed there was there was a lot of provision of care with love and compassion, yeah, from the heart. There was a lot of humility as well, yeah. And there was a lot of patients on both sides, both the patients and the doctors. Okay. So it's seeing human nature at its best. Actually, it's a very humbling experience. So the last time I was in the Philippines, it was for a much smaller mission. So this is like the biggest humanitarian effort that I was involved with, and it's a real eye-opener. And teamwork. You know, every person on the mission played a role in ensuring its success. Registration, providing food, you know, to the volunteers, because you're hungry, you can't be helping people. Yeah? And the pharmacies, dispensing medication. And even we got, you know, volunteers preparing balloons for the children. You know, most of the patients are children, and they would be accompanied by their moms, because the dads would be working. And imagine the children waking, waiting for hours. So there are volunteers entertaining them, giving them balloons, giving them snacks, singing songs to them, performances. It was all very holistic. It wasn't just, you are here for, for medical care. You are here to be looked after. 
So there were a lot of challenges. I mean, I was the only ENT doctor there. And ENT service is very equipment dependent. You know, you go to an ENT clinic in Singapore, you can see lots and lots of different machines. So the challenge for me was how can I replicate a high quality service and care that we provide in Singapore out in a place where there's hardly any ENT service. Even before the typhoon, in this huge island where there are several million people, apparently there were only five ENT surgeons serving a population of uh, five to seven million people. And all five ENT surgeons are in private practice. Yeah, it, it's staggering. Yeah, so the same population of Singapore having five ENT surgeons, but in private practice. So most of the people there have never seen an ENT doctor in their entire life. So what I did was I borrowed a lot of equipment from my own department. And thankfully, I had a lot of support, donations as well from the companies, drugs. Uh, and I had two very dedicated nurses who helped me run my station. Uh, I have to acknowledge them in the photos. And one of them used to work in Tan Tok Seng, the older one on the, on the left, and the younger one worked in KK, KK Hospital. So they are both full-time nurses uh, in Singapore. And most of the volunteers are healthcare professionals working in Singapore. So in terms of memorable patients, just quickly run through. Because uh, I had a lady who has been quite deaf for several years. And hers was quite a simple problem. It was just earwax. But it wasn't just ordinary earwax. She had about two centimeters of earwax in each ear. And not surprisingly, she can't hear. So I took out the earwax and it was very touching because she burst into tears immediately. And I thought, oh dear, have I done something wrong? Have I hurt her? And she burst into tears and she said, I can hear, I can hear. She had tears and no, that was very touching. Yeah? And, uh, so even there, you could say that this didn't happen as a result of the typhoon. But as a result of the typhoon, I volunteered myself to go there and I treated problems that have been there for a long, long time. And the typhoon provided an opportunity for me to provide care to the patient. And then there was a gentleman who had a crocodile <laughs> in the ear for two weeks. Okay, like, thankfully for him, it's died by then. It's Cockroach had died, but still having a dead cockroach, so that wasn't nice. And then, this one was touching as well. That I had a, how old was she? I think she was uh, 11 years old, 11 year old girl um, coming to see me, and the mom said, Doctor, um, my daughter's nose has been smelly for the last seven years. So imagine if you are 11 years old and you have a smelly nose, smelly in the sense that people can smell it. So she had no friends, you know, all her friends stayed away from her because she's known as a girl with a smelly nose. And she has this smelly stuff coming out from her nose. So for seven years, yeah, I looked inside and there was a piece of crayon that's been there for seven years. Took it out and the smell disappeared. Yeah, so instant elevation of suffering. Yeah, I mean, actually, it's quite a special feeling when you've got people suffering around you, people with chronic and not so chronic problems and you do something relatively simple problem goes away yeah and i think that's a very nice feeling for yourself and also for the patient can you imagine the how they feel about having the suffering taken away so this is my own example what i did when i was an ent doctor out there but there were many other doctors many other dentists and all many other nurses allied health i think i spotted at least one of them in the audience sister linda i think i spotted you no? Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah, she was with me uh, for, the, for the trip and Sister Linda worked in Tan Tok Seng Hospital. So everyone had their own stories to share about the witnessing how elevation of suffering. And uh, it's very touching when you share. Yeah? So this is uh, just three little stories out of many. And of course, there's an opportunity for fellowship. You know, you make new friends from around the world. Uh, and, you know, it's a good experience about how you look after one another, how you learn from one another, how you improvise. And, you know, when, like, when it's raining, trying to get to the bus, you know, the volunteers will just hold out the umbrellas, form a line, so that everyone can get to the bus without getting wet. It's things like that, the thoughtfulness. So you're not just caring about the patient, you care about everyone, including the people in, in the trip. And you inspire each other and is sharing the positive experience to their experiences together. 
And there was time for laughter. There was time for, for some fun as well. You know, at the end of the day, you are tired. But the thing is that you don't feel the tiredness. Yeah, you don't feel the tiredness until you get into bed. And then you fall asleep. Then you realize how tired you are. But while you're there, hundreds of patients a day, you just go on. Because you're driven by... I think when you're doing something positive, it's never tiring. Yeah. And of course, we always respect the local culture, so virtually all our patients are Catholic, and that was his picture taken in the mayor's house because he decided to host a dinner for us, the volunteers. And there was this little shrine in the house. Uh, we have a very nice uh, uh, image of uh, Mother Mary. Yeah. So what have I learned? Okay, this is the bit that I want to share a bit more as well. If you ask me, humanitarian work is Dharma in practice. It is literally Dharma in practice in many, many ways. I learned about the joy of altruistic giving on Dharma. I learned the meaning of gratitude. And I also learned about the realities of life. So I go through each of these three in a bit more detail. Now, you talk about altruistic giving or Dharma. That's a very important thing for Buddhists, right? Giving. Yeah? So, holds a special place for in Buddhist practice. In fact, if you listen to, if you read about the stories of the Buddha, right? What is the Buddha's biggest gift to us? The Dharma itself, right? And that's also the thing that we, we, believe, we accept as the highest gift, like the gift of the Dharma. So, most of us are quite happy to do anything possible to help uh, spread the Dharma. For example, like donating to uh, print books and things like that to be given up. But if you think about the Buddha, besides giving the Dharma, the Buddha didn't own anything himself, right? Physical. You know, he has renounced the world and he doesn't own, he doesn't have any money. So what else did he give that we sometimes we forget? The Buddha gave a lot during his time. Love and compassion. Caring for others. Yeah? That the Buddha did constantly. He cared a lot especially for the monk, people who are ill, the monks who are ill, the monastic, he would personally look after them. And that is dana as well. Dana is not just about giving material things. Yeah? Giving of knowledge, the dharma, that's important. But looking, giving your time, giving yourself, giving love, giving compassion, these are all dana as well. Yeah? And sometimes we may forget how there are other forms of dana besides material dana. And dana it provides a foundation for further spiritual practice. Because if you are selfish, you are not able to give. It's actually very hard to practice and, and further any, any form of your practice in, in, in Buddhism. Don't you agree? If you are if you're of a selfish nature, it's hard to make any progress in your spiritual practice. So, and it's often said that the, when the Buddha is expounding the Dharma for the people that he's meeting for the first time, the first thing that he will expound is about generosity, it's about giving. So dana is the foundation of Buddhist practice. And in fact, it's the first of the ten paramis of perfection, generosity, for us to perfect. And you may think that, mm, not that difficult. Actually, not that difficult, but not easy either. Yeah? And there are many different ways to give and serve. I think sometimes we get too caught up that we always think dana has to be just money. Yeah? Money to build a temple. Money to buy things for the monastics. It's always sometimes for the very devout Buddhists, we can be a bit too Buddhist centric. That dana has to be only to the temple, to the monastics. It has to be Buddhist based dana. And hopefully we can look beyond that. Of course, I think our Sangha needs to be supported, no doubt about that. And uh, we should be supporting our Buddhist community, Buddhist temples, Buddhist societies, definitely we should support them. But we should always think about doing dana beyond the Buddhist community. Yeah? So, besides money, we can give material things, food, medicine, time. Yeah? How many of you think, have you thought of dana, time, giving time as a dana? Yeah, we are also busy, right? And yet, quite often, that's the thing that sometimes we forget to give. In simple ways, you know, let's say if our friend is upset, they need someone to talk to. Just being that person to listen to them, 
Maybe the person to be the shoulder to cry on. Giving your time, giving your attention. That is dana. That is giving. Okay? Because money doesn't solve all the problems. Very frequently in Singapore, money doesn't solve the problem. What people need is love, time. You can also give your capability and expertise. Like for example, in the medical mission, if you've got expertise to give, that's what you give. Yeah? And you can give knowledge as well. A lot of my patients that I saw in the Philippines, they have chronic illnesses. I wasn't going to solve all the problems. I wasn't going to cure all of them. But I get my time and I get them good advice about what they can do, given the empowering them to control their illnesses better so that they, they get less symptoms. For example, a lot of my patients, they all have holes in their eardrums. They don't have intact eardrums, right? And in the Philippines, living in the islands, what do they love to do? They love to swim, right? So they constantly get ear infections because they got holes in their eardrums, they swim, water gets it, dirty water gets in, they get chronic play, infected ears. So just giving them advice, hey, you may like swimming, but maybe try and get some ear mold so that you, you stop water from going in or try to avoid diving too deep in. Yeah, simple advice that will hopefully reduce or stop all the ear infections, even though I was not able to provide the definitive treatment. Because in Singapore, you got a hole in the eardrum. If you come see me, I will offer you the opportunity to have the hole close up to an operation. And that way you can go swimming and you don't have to worry about water getting in. So in the Philippines, I wasn't able to do that because I didn't have the resources and there was just too many patients. So you have to think outside the box and think about simple things that works. And of course, if you can give money, you can give time, good. Give what you can. But if you cannot give any of it, at least give encouragement to others to do it. Do not discourage others from doing good deeds. So I think that's important, encouragement. Encouraging one another, hey, let, let us all try to do our little bit to do more good in life. And the positive effect of humanitarian work, I think if you look at the term altruistic giving, it's the principle or practice of concern for the welfare of others, i.e. sacrificing time, energy or possession with no expectations of any compensation or benefits, either directly or indirectly. It's actually quite hard, right? It's actually purely up. But it's something that we should aspire to do, that when you are helping others, do it with no expectation of receiving anything in return. And if you think about it, when you do that, you are developing and practicing metta and karuna, loving kindness and compassion. It's putting that in action, not just saying it, I will radiate loving kindness. It's good. At the very least, you radiate loving kindness. But it's even better if you can bring loving kindness to others. It helps you develop humility and patience. When you see how much suffering is there out there, yeah, and you realize that you are just a small person doing a little bit, it makes you very humble. It lets you develop patience as well because it takes a, it's not easy to get to these places. And you've got to be patient and say, okay, let's not be in a hurry. And of course, when you give, the more you give, it helps you reduce your greed and attachment. Right? So that's a good thing as a Buddhist, right? To, to learn to let go. It helps you develop morality and wisdom about doing what's right and wisdom in like uh, knowing that what you're doing is the correct thing. And of course, you bring happiness to yourself and to others and it broadens your life's perspective. It opens up your, your eyes, your windows to the world. I just want to mention about gratitude as well because I think it's something that's very important and something that maybe we don't have enough sometimes. As I said, Singapore is largely free of natural disasters, but around us, our neighboring countries, you know, we're in the Pacific Rim, we're earthquake prone, typhoon prone, and I think we've got to be grateful that Singapore, we are on very stable ground. And we are protected from the, the worst of the typhoons. So myself, I've yet to be a victim, and I've yet to need humanitarian assistance myself, and I'm grateful, I'm very grateful of that. I'm sure you all feel the same, right? Yeah, that as a country, Singapore, hopefully, will continue to remain free of natural disaster. So let's be thankful of what we have. Let's be thankful of, even though we have bad weather, heavy rain, the infrastructure that the government has put in place, the good drainage system, uh, to ensure that we don't get flooding. In fact, all the water will go into what Brother Yap <laughs> has done, you know, the <laughs> Marina Barrage, <laughs> can be reused to provide uh, water for us. And another thing to be grateful about is that if you have the opportunity to do humanitarian work, is to have gratitude that yourself, if you are able to do it, that you actually have the good health yourself, uh, mental health and 
uh, physical health, that you earn enough to be comfortable yourself, that you can actually give up some of your income to help others. And also gratitude that for myself that I have an understanding wife who supports me. Because each time I'm away, five days, it means that my wife is a single mom looking after two kids with no family support. So it can't be easy for her. So I have a lot of gratitude to her as well, that she's very understanding. Gratitude to my work colleagues for allowing me time off because someone has to cover my work. So I think that's a, just the fact that I get to do humanitarian work means that I have so much to be grateful for that the opportunity for me to help others. And then reminder of the realities of life. Now, there are many realities in life. But of course, the first noble truth is that life is suffering, yeah? So there's much suffering in life. Sometimes in a place like Singapore where you know, things tend to be quite good for most people, we can forget how that there can be a lot of suffering. That we, because we don't see it, it's not, it doesn't happen to people close to us. We forget that there's suffering in the world. It reminds us that there's climate change for human activities, that we need to play our role as well, yeah, to lessen the environmental impact of our day-to-day -day living. And there are still many things that mankind is unable to control. And th these are all truths in life. Okay, yeah, even though in Singapore we try to control everything. But <laughs> and to a large extent we've managed to, yeah, the water <coughs> supply and everything, but there's still many things, the weather, earthquakes and things like that. But I think when you do humanitarian work, you realize that there are a lot of people out there that still have a lot of kindness, yeah? a lot of people with a good heart. It's possible to make a difference. You mustn't say, oh, there's so much suffering in the world. Even if I help this one person, what about the millions of others that I can't help? The way I look at it, if you help this one person, you have elevated the suffering for this one person. That matters. Yeah, because if every one of us help another person, one by one, we elevate suffering for yet another person. So you mustn't say that, oh, too, this problem is too big, too much suffering. If I help them this year, next year another typhoon, what's going to happen there? But, you know, you help them this time, you elevate the suffering, you lessen the suffering for now. Don't worry too much for the future. Happens again, you go and help them a second time, or someone else will do it. You encourage others, you spread the message. So that I go this year, next year I don't have time, someone else goes. Yeah? So that's, it's possible to make a difference. Every little bit counts. And there's a need for us as a Buddhist to help spread metta and karuna, loving kindness in our community. Yeah, because ultimately it means a better, a better society that we live in. I want to quickly mention that for Suji, right? You probably know that it's quite a Chinese-based organization. And if you go to the Philippines and Indonesia, it's largely supported by the Chinese community there. And what they will tell you is that, um, I don't know if you're aware, but in Philippines and the Indonesia, the relationship between the local Chinese community and the indigenous population has not always been good. For example, in Indonesia, you know, there were things that happened a, a couple of decades ago. But through the effort of Suichi, it has actually improve the relationship between the Chinese community and the indigenous people. Yeah? And they could actually see, they could actually sense the difference. So in terms of the karma of the entire community, it's been a very positive thing. Yeah? So something to think about. Okay. So I just want to quickly go through some of the organizations in Singapore where you can, if you want to, choose to volunteer. So the one that I volunteer with is Suji Foundation, started in Taiwan, 1966, and the Singapore branch, 1987 located in Pasir Ris, and these are what it aims to promote charitable services, medical care, moral development, humanity activity, international relief work, which is what the Tima gets involved with, bone marrow donation. In fact, it has the largest uh, registry for Chinese patients in the world. So if you're unlucky enough to have leukemia, your best chance of getting a match, not from your own family, is through the Suchi uh, Global Registry. I think so far about nearly 100 patients in Singapore have benefited environmental protection, community volunteerism, and it runs two free clinics in Singapore. Uh, you, don't you don't have to be a medic or in allied health to help out because they have a lot of other non-medical activities as well. Firefly Mission, I think probably Sister Vita would be a better place to tell you more. <laughs> but initially started, I think it's a sub of Buddhist fellowship, right? But now it runs quite independently, but I think a lot of Buddhist fellowship members do participate and support. And they run a lot of uh, similar humanitarian work 
in Bangladesh, Myanmar, and the neighboring countries. I had the opportunity to, to speak with Brother Yi Kong, so I do understand a lot of the work, and I hope to be able to join uh, Firefly one day as well. And like Suchi, 100% uh, paid for by their own volunteers. And also they visit the Bukit Batok Home for the Aged as their regular uh, local activity. The other uh, NGO uh, that I'm quite passionate about is uh, the Brown Centre. I'm sure most of you would have heard of it. It's uh, based in Renju Hospital and it's a registered voluntary welfare organisation in Singapore. It's quite young, only two years old, two years plus. And uh, it has IPC status, so that's recognition from the government of, about the good work that it's doing. Um, and it's dedicated to offering educational programs and activities that promote happy and healthy living. And uh, all the activities are, well, most are offered free of charge to make them accessible to all. And the one thing that we need more volunteers for would be the hospital befriender service, where we befriend patients with chronic illnesses, those with poor social support, with the aim of trying to reduce their constant hospital readmission. And training is provided for that. So this is one area where you can do humanitarian work in Singapore where you are serving the needy in Singapore. So humanitarian work is not just overseas. Then the Singapore Buddhist Welfare Services. Again, I'll just quickly go through because I think I'm running a, a bit out of time. Uh, Meta Welfare, I think Brother Al was uh, heavily involved with that before uh, in his earlier years. So a lot of uh, good work as well. They run like uh, homes and a school for children with learning uh, difficulties. Yeah and others. These are all Buddhist-based uh, organizations, uh, Buddhist Lodge, Fo Kuang Chan, Tai Pei, the Runsu Nursing Home, and uh, Tai Hua Kwan, and Kong Wa Shu Hospitals, uh, Community Hospitals. So, okay, I'm nearly done now. So, humanitarian work with gratitude and wisdom. I think I always consider it a privilege that I'm able to give and serve. And always consider the needs of your recipients rather than your own needs. Give without any expectations of anything in return. Always wish your recipient well. You know, if they're hungry, if you are giving them food, wish them that their hunger goes away. Oops, sorry. If, you, if they are unwell, wish them well, physical wellness or mental wellness. And always wish them well and happy, to be well and happy, and try to give in a timely manner, if possible. If, uh, especially if there's a disaster and you're able to take time off to help out. That'd be good. So to conclude, uh, humanitarian work is a positive way to practice and to realize the Dharma. It helps you develop metta, karuna, and gratitude, three very important qualities. It helps you realize the true nature of the world. And there are many, many opportunities for humanitarian work in and outside Singapore. I mentioned this because I mentioned some of the pitfalls of doing humanitarian work. So if you are new to it, don't try to reinvent the wheel. Find out what's really happening. Volunteer first. Join the established organization. Once you're more comfortable, you know, of course, I'm not saying that you shouldn't set up a project of your own if there's something you're passionate about, but try to get some experience first so that you can avoid some of the short uh, pitfalls when you set up your own project. And give whenever, whatever you can, whenever possible, to those who need help at the right place and at the right time. Sadhu. What an inspiring talk this morning. Uh, let's give Dr. Ho, Brother Ho, uh, another round of applause. <laughs> well, well, he really shared the Dharma with us. And this is in action, Dharma in action. I think now we open for questions. Now there's Henry Do. Thank you, Dr. Ho. Just two sharing. Uh, point one is that I think in April, keep yourself free because Buddhist fellowship from the, I think, 18 to the 24th of uh, April, we are actually doing a tour plus a humanitarian visit to Lombok, Bali, and Jakarta. So uh, find the details from Vincent or Mr. Ao. And the other point too is that if you can 
on the 7th and 8th of February, two weeks before Chinese New Year, Suchi has their fun fair at Pasir Ris. It is about 15 to 20 times the size of Buddhist Fellowship Fun Fair. And uh, when you go there, there's a lot of learning points. You get impressed by the volunteers. Two, you actually, they have panels to show the humanitarian work. Three, you'll be also impressed by the efforts they do to promote uh, green, you know. You are encouraged to bring your own containers, plastic bags. And uh, last year when I went there, I bought that T-shirt, it's fantastic. It's like silk, it's not expensive, it's cool, it's cotton, and it's made from recycled plastic bottles. And they all do this uh, so that in case of disaster, blankets, clothing are all made from recycled. Do support them. 7, 8 of February, Pasiris MRT. Thank you, thank you. Yes, uh, bravo to actually the uh, doctor. I just want to say thank you so much. I think that is very impressive, uh, very inspirational. Uh, I believe uh, a man your age is fantastic for that Dharma that you have taught. Uh, it's hard to come by that you share something like that, which is very practical, very, uh, I would say, uh, the Dharma itself is what you have done that I think is very, very well shared. Thank you so much. Another one. Hi, good morning, Doctor. Uh, thanks for your sharing. I'd like to ask, uh, for the humanitarian missions, uh, most of the people, we can see how doctors would contribute, nurses, uh, medical staff, uh, but I think most of the people who want to help uh, might not be trained medically. Is there a room for people like myself, like uh, maybe a white collar worker or something, <laughs> to go and help? Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I think. Um, sorry, sorry, is the mic still on? Yeah. Thank. Thanks for asking the question. And yes, I'm aware that not everyone is a healthcare worker. I think the the great thing about Suichi if you are talking about just this one organization is that uh, I think there's room for everyone to be involved. Uh, even for the medical missions, obviously uh, they got to have a certain number of medical uh, or allied health practitioners, but even if you're non-medical, there are ways you can contribute. Uh, for example, people who help provide the logistics, the food, uh, people to involve in the media. So there are, there are other ways to contribute. La. And then some of the humanitarian missions are medical and non-medical as well, so like provision mm. of aid and like uh, giving up of uh, supplies, food and things like that. So there are, there are many different ways. Perhaps uh, try to find out more about the activities in Singapore first. And I think in Singapore, they search in particular, they need many more volunteers to look after the, I mean on the medical side, certainly there's a lot of patients with chronic illnesses and they need volunteers to like visit them and yeah, so get get involved and then you can find out. So I think the, the best way is to get involved in any organization, find out more, and then you will find a, you'll find a room for yourself. You know, like for me as an ENT surgeon, I was thinking, mm, how do I, you know, because going to these remote places, you don't straight away think about some of the more complex specialties, and ENT is quite a complex specialty where you need specialized equipment. So I saw like after the initial trip in Manila the year before, I've got a better understanding of what is needed, and then you can plan around and, and make it work for yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, wait, Linda, wait. Nah. Because in Tsuji, we actually do a lot of um, humanitarian work in places where it's uh, not accessible. Like for example, the area that Dr. Ho has brought up, Takoban or Mok, uh, sometimes we don't have electricity, water supply. And uh, Dr. Ho, you didn't go to Sri Lanka with us, right? Okay, in Sri Lanka, when we go, actually the first group went, they actually surveyed the place. There were no electricity and there were no, the water supply were uh, not very bad, uh, not sufficient. So they actually had to run pipe 
So people with engineering and uh, plumbing um, expertise, all these actually will come into good use. And we, we need people, lay people like who can do registration as well. Actually, everybody can help. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, Sister Linda has touched on a very good point. Uh, humanitarian uh, need not be big projects, need not be professional skills, just primarily for medical or structural or engineering skills. Actually, humanitarian can also start from the young. Um, and, and truly, there are many amongst us here uh, who have been doing humanitarian work from a very, very young age and even starts from home. Uh, here in Singapore, like here in Buddhist Fellowship, um, on the weekends as well as on, on Fridays and, uh, and Saturdays when they visit Renshu, actually our young people from our Rahula class and our, our junior youth and our youth, they are also doing Dharma in action. Okay? So don't think of uh, humanitarian work has to be big projects and big engineering projects. Uh, the, there were two well, I don't want to boast but I also want to point out that in Buddhist fellowship here, we run humanitarian programs. And when Myanmar disaster started, soon after Myanmar disaster started, the two youngest members of Buddhist fellowship, the youngest one was only primary one. The second youngest was primary four. So these two children entered Myanmar at a very young age when they were primary one and primary four, and right now, last year, one was, one was 16 and the other one was 13, and it's their seventh trip to Myanmar because, like what Brother Hole has mentioned, humanitarian work is not about the tools that you use with your hands. It's about the language of the heart. Once your heart has been opened and touched, you will walk the path of love. So try that, even though if you don't have the skill, if you, if you don't think you know, um, that you can be there to teach people how to count money, but you can teach people how to do mathematical sums. Why not? Right? If, you, if you cannot be there to teach people how to read Chinese because you're a Chinese teacher, but you can teach them how to sing a song, why not? All right? Sometimes humanitarian work need not be words. It's just a feeling of touch. So come and experience locally before you even venture outside. Okay? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry, I just uh, want to check. Uh, in the audience, how many of you are healthcare professionals besides uh, Brother Henry and Sister Linda? Any, any more? Just raise your hand. A few, huh? Okay. Uh, how many of you are in uh, healthcare professionals? Yeah. Okay, I just uh, I think I should take the opportunity to publicize the fact that uh, uh, Suchi is organizing a medical conference in March, 6th to the 8th of March, uh, and the topic is on humanistic uh, medicine. Yeah, it's about the practice of uh, how to be a better healthcare professional. Yeah. And I have to say that being involved in all these activities have made me a better doctor to my patients here. Yeah, how I relate to my patients. So it does transform. So for those who are in healthcare, 6th to the 8th of March, uh, there is a Suchi conference. It's called the Tima Conference 2015. So it, it's online. You can look it up and you can register online as well. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any more last question? Uh, thank you, Dr. Ho. I got a short uh, announcement. Next Sunday, there's a one-day retreat by Pan.